Father, that's our prayer. That's our proclamation. Lord, we cry to you and just say, we're going to stand in these days that we live in, in these dark times that we live in. And what we are and who we are, we commit over to you, Lord. Use us in these last days. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to meet us here and you would fill us with your Holy Spirit in this place in us. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us direction to move. Thank you for family. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, how's everybody doing? Cool, huh? It's uh, time to nod out during devotion time, huh? And I see everybody who nods out, too, in here. Those of you I know who ate the most, it's going to be kind of doing one of these things. But my son told me I only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to make sure we make this quick. I know a lot of little ones in here. Well, am I only speaking on my little one's behalf, I think. Uh, but it's good to be here with you guys as family. I think we like to do this, uh, you know, because it's a, a reminder of what family is. Uh, we live in a time today where family and the concepts of family, the idea of the family, marriage, is just so thwarted and so lost in our society today. I think it's certainly we see it in our, uh, in our nation today and all the different changes that are going on that uh, the idea of being family and, and fighting for family is kind of a lost, it's becoming a lost cause. Uh, our, our nation is just giving up on, on, on what the, the old ways of defining family and that's a sad thing. And so Christians today are put in a place where we're kind of, we're going, wait a minute here. We, we know that what's right. We know what God calls us for the family. We know what God, how God calls us to be as husbands, as wives, and how we should be raising our children in the ways of the Lord. But the society today is saying something contrary to that. Society is saying, you know, hey, uh, it don't matter, you know, really what goes on in the home. Uh, hey, you, what's up? What's wrong with two dads? You know what I mean? I mean, and that's what society is saying today. And we're kind of going, what on earth is happening here, Lord? How are you even allowing this to happen today? But we are the church, us in here, and those of us that we know that are believers of the last days who are going to either do one of two things, and that's take a stand against what uh, the world is classifying family as, or we're going to just kind of be like, oh, whatever, man, I'll just kind of do what I do inside my house, and, you know, I guess we can create our own ways and our own standards and more. Or you're going to be one of those that say, you know what, I'm going to use God's word as the foundation and as a premise of everything I do in the family. And so I just wanted to share real quick a scripture with you guys. Uh, we're, as the men know, we're in, we've been reading through 2 Samuel for some time now. And I wanted to read a scripture in which uh, one thing I've been doing is saying we're going to finish a chapter. We're going to read a chapter, but I haven't got to a chapter in I don't know how long it's been now. And, and in about a month, thank you for reminding us on the actual time it's been. Uh, and we were going to read in chapter 21 tonight. Uh, and I hope you have your Bibles as a family. Uh, and you can share with one another. I'm only going to hopefully read one scripture. Uh, and I just kind of want to elaborate on this concept for a second. Um, chapter 21, verse 16 of 2 Samuel is where we as the men have left off, and uh, I know last week was awesome. Scotty did the message, right? Yeah. Where's Scotty at? He's here? Yeah. I heard he did a fabulous job. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, we have so many guys in this study that are gifted and that are used by the Lord to minister, and I, hopefully we can continue to see all the brothers come out and do that. So chapter 21, verse 16, it says, And Ish, whatever that guy's name is, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So what I wanted to just briefly talk about as a family is what we're getting into in our scripture reading as men is we're about to talk about the giants. Okay, and the, and the giants that existed in the Old Testament scripture are a, a very unique breed of people. And usually today when we start talking about the giants, it leads people into gnarly Bible studies. You get into, you know, who are the giants? Uh, uh, how were they created? Some people think they were part alien, you know, part uh, human and all these kinds of things. And it's kind of a, a pretty unique Bible study when you start talking about the giants. 
But the concept of which we're going to see tonight is turning these giants of the Old Testament and classifying them as the giants of our lives today. Because I think there's something that runs consistent in the scripture when you start talking about these giants. And that's what I want to mention. But first, talking about where these giants came from is kind of a unique and interesting story. The giants to us is found in Genesis chapter 6. And it tells us that these giants came from a, an unholy relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. An unholy, wicked, defiled relationship that took place created these, this special breed of, of you know, sla human slash, you know, whatever, giants, you know, mutant people, so to speak. And we know that these people had a very large impact in society at that time because the Bible says that they end up becoming very destructive. And the one characteristic that I want to camp on about these giants, it starts in Numbers chapter 13, verse 28. And I'm just going to start paraphrasing these stories. But in Numbers chapter 13, we have the story when the children of Israel were about to go into the promised land that they had. We all know that story, right? We know the story when the children of Israel were like, hey, God said, hey, come down from this Mount Sinai, and I want you to go into the land that I promised for you. If God was to come to every single one of us in this room tonight, and he was to say, hey, look, check it out. I have a plan for you. I have a promise for your life. I have a direction for you. And he was to show it to you, right? Show you a picture of it, maybe. And there you are in the picture. You're standing there with your thumbs up, and you're in the new land, okay? And God was to say, this is what I have for you. And you were to go like, oh, man, that looks awesome. Look at that picture. Look at all the stuff that's around me. I mean, look at the furniture. Look at the house that's in the background. I mean, God has an awesome promise for me. Wouldn't you be like, okay, God, where do I sign? I'm ready for it. God, I'm ready to get there. Let, let's get there. That's exactly what he did for the children of Israel. He said, look at the fruit. These grapes are the size of your head. He said, these, the fruit there that's in the promised land is amazing. It's all for you. The fruit that I have into the land that I'm taking you into, it's all for you. I've won the victory. I paid the price for it already. Here you go. Come and get the fruit. Now, we all would sit back and say, hey, I'm game, right? I mean, let's get there. Don't throw me in that picture. I want to get in there. Um, but something happens throughout the scripture that happens to us today. There always seems to be someone that presents himself, herself, itself in the way, and that is a giant. You see, when the children of Israel were given the picture of the fruit, there's 10 guys by word of mouth came back and did what? They discouraged them from going into the land. And what did they do to discourage them? They said, hey, dude, uh, hey, that fruit looks good and all. We actually tasted some of it. But, man, there are giants over there that will squish us. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Man, we can't get past these giants. There's no way. But you're sitting there going, wait a minute, though. The picture right here looks pretty good. The fruit looks pretty good. I want to get into that. And then they're going, yeah, but the giants are huge. See, this unholy matrimony created something that was going to now limit and prohibit God's people from going into the promised land. We know it happens again later on in the future, don't we? When Israel was ready for war, they were going against the Philistines. And what was it that kept them from going? Another giant by the name of Goliath. See, God says, hey, Saul, I want you to take your armies and I want you to just go and capture all of this land that I have for you. Go and take victory that I have for you. And then all of a sudden, someone comes in on the scene, and it's this big old giant. And he's sitting there laughing at Israel. Oh, hey, man, you guys, you don't know what you're doing. You know, I, I, I'll take on anybody. Come on, bring it on. I'll smash you. I'll squish you. And everybody's going, oh, man, what are we going to do, Saul? We can't get past this giant. See, guys, the giants that we're up against in our society today are the same giants that they were up against throughout the entire Old Testament of the Scripture. The giants that we're up against in our own personal lives today are the same giants that they were up against in their own personal lives. Every single one of us in this room has seen the promise. We know what the word says. We know what the Bible teaches us. We know that we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We know that we have promises given to us here in this word. We know that he who begun a good work in our lives is going to be faithful to complete. Don't we know that? But sometimes we just can't cross that line, isn't it? Sometimes we go, oh, man, I feel that God has a calling for me. I know he has a place for me in ministry. I know he has something for me and my family to do, but something always gets in the way. What's that giant for you and your family? Is it society? Oh, gosh. 
Certainly it could be. Is it fear of not being accepted? Is it fear that you're not capable of getting there? Is it financial? Finan I, I see a financial giant all the time. Is it, what is it? Is it pride? You see guys, these giants don't change their objective. Their objective is to stop you from going forward into the place that God has called you to go forward. Their objective is to stop your family from going forward and becoming that the family that God has called you to be. How many of us have a giant sitting in our living room right now? You know what I'm saying? Come on, man, smash that thing. Giants come sometimes these days in small shapes like iPhones. Amen to that. They used to be smaller in the size of a pager. And they got a little bit bigger. And see, there are so many things, guys, that confront us as men, as wives, as family. I know every single one of us, if I was to say right now, how many of you guys want to lead your children down the cliff so they die? Nobody would raise their hand. But if I was to say to everybody in this room, how many of us want to raise our children in the ways of the Lord? How many of us want to do what's right? We'd all go, yeah, that's what we want to do. But once you do that, then up comes that giant. Up comes that thing that says, you can't do this. What do you think you are? I'll squish you. You're like a grasshopper. The giant comes with words out of ten spies' mouths that brought discouragement. How words can destroy. How easy the words can discourage. People today so often use words and they find themselves inputting information on whether it's social media, whether it's on the news, whether it's in areas that we all are familiar with, whether it's Facebook, whether it's different things, people are constantly putting things to keep the work of God from moving forward because the enemy knows how to use it and it works every time. I was sitting in a devotion this morning with Pastor Jeff and it was an incredible word. And he taught on Nehemiah. And he said, one of the things that the enemy tried to do was write a letter to, to, to Nehemiah and to threaten him by this letter and these words. And, he, and the enemy wanted to use these words to keep Nehemiah from going forward to the work that God called him to do. Nehemiah got to make a choice. He got to say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and go out there where they're calling me to, or I'm just going to have out ignore the whole thing. See, guys, when the enemy presents himself, with these types of ways, these, these words, these words of discouragement, these words that might bring fear, we have to say, I have nothing to do with it. I have no part of it. And you as a man in your home, are you doing that? You as a wife, are you supporting your husband in that way where you're saying, honey, let's not go there? Because that's straight up from the enemy. That's from the pit of hell. Are we doing that today? Guys, we have to. We don't have no choice anymore. Because to go on the other side is so convenient these days. To say, you know, let's just be like, oh, homegirl. Yeah, I want to be like my friends. I want to be like the boys at the shop. How about I just want to go out Friday night, you know what I mean? Oh, well, guess what you're going to do, man? You're going to lead your family right down to the pit of hell. Because you're neglecting the work that God has set before you. And that's to find value, and that's to find sacrifice for what we call family today. These giants are everywhere, man. And the scripture reading, the one verse I wanted to read tonight... And I'm just going to paraphrase the whole story, so sorry, man. I usually read verse by verse, but I'm just going to read what the context of verse 16 through 21 is. You know, I'm just going to read it. Bear with me. Verse 17. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, Thou shalt go out no more with us to battle, David. You're getting old, man. Chill out. That thou quench not the light of Israel. Poor David. Imagine that would be a bummer to hear. Hey, David, stop coming out with us, man. You're a bummer. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines, okay, and which was to the sons of the giant. It, they, so now we see Israel fighting all these giants. And there was again a battle at Gob, verse 19, the Philistines, where this guy, the son of that guy, and Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath, okay, the Gittite, the staff whose spear was like a weaver's beam. I love this because it's really describing these guys as massive. And look at verse 20. And there was yet a battle again. So repeating itself. There's battle after battle after battle of all these giants. Where a man of great statue that had, look at, on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. He was a six-fingered guy. A six-toed guy. I don't even know, man, what that means. Four and 20 in number. The, okay, it, the Bible emphasizes he had 24 of these things. And he was also born to the giants. 
And when he defiled Israel, watch this, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. The point of this scripture we need tonight is this. David no longer was the only man that was able to slay a giant. David became the only man in scripture to raise up giant slayers with him. He became the only guy in scripture that says, you know what? I'm not going to just slay giants by myself. I want to teach everybody else how to do it too. Because there's something about passing on a message that teaches people on how to have victory. Guys, it's not meant for us just to slay, just see someone else slay a giant and go, wow, that guy is crazy, man. Did you see him take care of that? Wow, those people are really smart and spiritual. Look what they do at church. No, it isn't about that. It's about all of us going, wait a second. I think this scripture is teaching me that we all in this room have the ability to overcome giants just the same as David did. Are we learning this today? Is it becoming like a virus today? No, it's not. What the virus is today is the exact opposite. It's teaching people how to accept the giants in their lives and to live among them. That is wrong. You see, what we should be doing, guys, is we should be looking at one another, being in fellowship with one another, learning from what, being in married couple studies, being in home Bible studies, and saying, guys, what we need to do in these last days is learn as a group, as a body of Christ, as a ministry of Christ, learn how to slay giants together because we're all capable of doing it. You see, the Bible taught us that. David said, no more. I can't die with this secret. I can't die with the only, you know, he knew the juggler where to get it on one of them six toes. He found it. And he had to teach these guys how to find the same thing. The question that I always think is, am I teaching my wife how to slay giants? Am I teaching my sons, no matter how old or young they are, to slay giants? Am I showing them as a dad how to overcome these things that are going to be chasing them their whole entire lives? Are we showing each other as brother, brothers and sisters in marriages to say, hey, I know that marriage is struggling. I know that family's going through it. Are we teaching one another how to, how to find victory in these things? Or are we sitting back going, oh, gosh, that's going to be a rough one. Just wait till they hit like the second month, you know. Are we doing that? Or are we getting boldness to stand up and say enough is enough in these last days when what the concepts of families are so thwarted that we're going to stand up and say, no, this is what families should look like. You shouldn't be doing that. This is how you overcome that giant. This is how you win that victory. You know, the deadliest thing, I think, for most Christians today is the finding comfort in being silent over the issue. If you know of somebody struggling, if you know of some warfare taking place in someone's life, don't remain silent. Come alongside that brother or sister and tell them what you've learned on how to overcome that or else they're going to be overtaken and overcome by the threats and the words of those giants that exist. Let's be like David, man. And you women can be like David, too. And let's teach one another how to overcome that. Let's no longer allow these things to come in our lives and stop us or hinder us from going forward and becoming that couple, that family, that man, that woman that God has called us to be. You see, the sad part about it is the giants will always win if you let them. If you let them stand in front of you and cause threat in your life, they will always prohibit you from going forward into the life that God has for you. You got you to learn, man, or else you're going to stay. And what happened to the children of Israel when they were discouraged? They end up wandering. For how long? And they died there. And the only two people that went forward in the promised land were who? Bible trivia. Huh? Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because when they got presented the fruit, what did they say at that time? Let's get in there, man. We are well able to take that land. I don't care what's living over there. Watch this. But you see, the discouragement kept everyone from going. And poor old Joshua and Caleb had to wait another 40 years until they were able to get there. And now this next is for all you old guys in here. Caleb and Joshua, Caleb was 80, what was 85 years old. And you know what ended up happening after that? He went and slew the giants. He didn't care how old he was. He says, I'm 85, man, but watch this. I'll, I got some cane action going on. And I'm going to handle those giants. And I'm going to go take the land that God promised to me. I don't care how old I am. You see, guys, that means that victory, victory can be given no matter how old, 
no matter how young you are. I sometimes do that. I fail with me thinking my kids won't understand what I'm trying to teach them. My son's nine, seven, my daughter's four. I try to do Bible studies with them, and they're like, they're flipping circles. They're, you know, picking their hair and their ears, and I'm like, they're not getting it. But, you know, that's my failure because they are receiving it. They are receiving it. And it, so it doesn't matter. Victory can be attained no matter what age you are because Jesus ain't limited by our age. What he's limited by is your fear and discouragement that you allow for these giants to bring in your life. Victory is ours as a family, as if you're alone, and sometimes you're married and you're alone. We got to overcome these things, guys, especially in these times when our world is lying to us, when society is lying to us, and the enemy is gaining so much more coverage and victory in the, in the concepts of what we're even doing here tonight. I say we join forces like David, and I say we teach one another, we teach our family and our children on how to overcome these things, because victory is entitled to the believer. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for this word, and we thank you for uh, the promises of your word, how, Lord, we can come together, and we can hear a word like this and say, I want to become a giant slayer. I want to... I want to take my family down that, that road. I want to take my, I no longer want to be limited as to the calling you've put on our lives. I no longer want to be hindered by what I've seen to be a giant, what always seems to keep me from going forward. And so I want for this moment right now, everybody just keep praying and everybody just kind of, if you can, if you're a strong believer and, and you got your walk right, just pray for those who you know that are going through it. And I want to give you guys a chance right now, whether you're a husband and wife, whether you're single or whatever, if you feel like you've been limited and tonight is the night you want to surrender and begin to experience victory, I want to pray for you. So raise your hand. If you're in here tonight, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you guys. Hands everywhere. God bless you. And God knows your heart. He hears it. And the funny thing is, is you probably hear him right now. And you probably feel that pull. Because that pull is the Holy Spirit pulling on you, saying, give it up now. Because what the Holy Spirit is, is calling you to do is he's saying, I want to give you victory now over these things. I don't want you to struggle with them anymore. I don't want you to fight over these things anymore. I want you to learn how to defeat them. And it's up to you to be a Caleb and Joshua or to be like the rest of the multitude. To say, oh, no, I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm going to stay back or to say I'm going forward. God bless you. God bless you guys. Thanks. All of you guys that are lifting your hands, and you're not lifting your hands for me, you're lifting, lifting them for the Lord. And he sees that, and he hears your heart. Anybody else? God bless you. Bless you guys. God bless you. Me too. A lot of you guys in here. You're going to walk out of here victorious. Not fighting these same old lousy things that are always at the table of our lives. Man, give it up, man. God bless you guys. And so, Father, I want to pray for all of my brothers and sisters in here tonight that are surrendering these things that uh, only you know what it is that they're dealing with. So, Lord, I just pray a prayer of power that you will give them uh, the power of your Holy Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by your spirit. So I pray that you would give them the strength to be able to overcome, help them to come together, help them to fellowship, help them to receive, give them direction, Lord, and how to move forward victoriously in this life in this ever decaying moral state of our nation and all of these other things that we're up against as family and as Christians in general. So Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this, this fellowship. Continue to be in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.